Anxiety over fertility is once again fashionable. This isn't the first time, it was fashionable in the 1920s and in the 1970s as well, each time for mostly wrong reasons, just like today. But what's different today is that the discussion is no longer just among those who at the very least know the basics of what they're talking about, but rather among everyone. This can be a positive, up to a point, but it's also routinely a negative. Most people don't have the curiosity to learn, for instance, the difference between the birth rate and the total fertility rate, which means most people are susceptible to intentional manipulation and disinformation from various actors with an ulterior motive. But okay, that's always a risk after all with any topic. But what's worse is that lack of basic knowledge is coupled with ideological possession routinely, which results in very bad anti-historical and routinely anti-human takes, which are then taken as gospel by too many who don't know better. In the end, the whole conversation is polluted even more and the topic becomes well, impossible to discuss. And this is where we are today. So in this series, it's nearly inevitable that I will piss off everyone. But then again, that's why you do come to the sofa. For nice things you want to hear, there's plenty of other channels who do that. So demographics and fertility are not an economic issue. The economics is being intentionally overstated and overestimated due to inherent materialist bias that has been permeating nearly all social science for over 50 years now. Demographics is also not a left-right issue, except for extremist cultures like South Korea or the United Kingdom or the United States. There are very sound left-wing and right-wing arguments in favor of natalism, but also in favor of antinatalism. Anyone who doesn't acknowledge that right off the bat is either ignorant or has something to sell to you, be it an ideology, a lifestyle, a product, or a specific policy prescription. Demographics is a biology and mood issue. The national mood of a country determines that country's demographic trends a lot more than nearly all other factors. The problem is that this reality doesn't sit well with most ideological groups and as such it is routinely ignored in favor of less relevant facets of the discussion. Oh, and it doesn't help that online discourse uh, on this issue is heavily influenced by a US-centric worldview. In some topics, um, a US-centric view can be very helpful, but not on this one. Our American friends have gotten so extreme on these things that the cultural and ideological considerations of the US over demographics are in fact toxic to the conversation at this point. The ideals uh, and the ideas held by average Americans about family life, sex, finances, or love are so way outside of the global norm that they're thus extremist. Heck, the average American holds ideas that are extremist even to European liberals. Now, that in itself is a performance, it's just not in a good way a performance. Now, if I pissed you off enough, join me in delving into this topic in a way that at least doesn't start with crazy assumptions. Maybe. Let's explore. Hello everyone and welcome to the first installment of the Fertility and Demographic series here on the Freedom Alternative. Alright, so this series is the result of about five months of thinking about this, reading about 5,000 pages, probably even more than that, of studies, academic papers and articles about this, and also months of lurking into the most consistent pro-natalist and anti-natalist spaces in an attempt to find their best or strongest arguments with an initial view to demolish them. I had to change that view mid-process because I gotta say, 
The strongest anti-natalist talking points made me sympathize with the pro-natalists, and the strongest pro-natalist talking points made me sympathize a lot more with anti-natalists. Like, for real. The strongest pro-natalist talking point is that without more births, uh, state grifts like social security or state pension systems in Europe or North America will collapse. And I'm like, yes, great! I mean, that is the best anti-natalist argument I've heard in decades. State pension systems collapsing is uh, unambiguously a very good thing for the moral progress of our civilization. State pension systems are intergenerational Ponzi schemes that are inherently immoral and do deserve to collapse, preferably in the most spectacular way possible. But then I head towards the antinatalists, where the copium would make certain psychiatric words look like bastions of moral sanity by comparison. The intellectual side of antinatalism is not the feminists in the academe, but the autists in the academe. The strongest argument by the intellectual side of antinatalism is the hypothetical consent argument. Procreation, intellectual antinatalists claim, imposes a non-trivial and unconsented harm on the individual who is created for the purposes of bestowing a pure benefit. Those who would create then do not have the hypothetical consent of the individuals they pro procreate. Why is this the case? Because if an individual does not exist, he or she cannot be harmed nor benefited. Language is misleading here, because when procreation does not occur, there is no individual who does not exist. Thus, procreation always involves bestowing a pure benefit, and in a hypothetical consent framework, this is impermissible. So, translation into human speak, you shouldn't have a kid, because you don't have the kid's consent for the kid to exist. And you need such consent, because existence itself can be harmful, and it is thus not a net benefit inherently. Yes, really. People are being paid hundreds of thousands of dollars a year in academia to write and think garbage like this. I'm serious. The non-intellectual, or let's say the populist anti-natalist crowd, follows the intellectual framework with a more down-to-earth set of ideas, but also mixed with modernity's ills, just like pro-natalists, namely hyper-partisanship and materialist bias. So the strongest populist anti-natalist arguments also center around consent, economic policy, but also cost. Now, we'll talk about cost quite a bit in episode 3. So, Overall, the level of discourse on both sides of the argument is far more toxic than I had hoped it would be back in March, when I decided to start looking into this. So, under these considerations, uh, the only way left to approach this is through a more holistic, or dare I say, zoom out type of approach. I'm sure I will not do the best job, but I'm also sure at the end of this series you will at least gain a better understanding of the phenomenon beyond the unhinged rants that permeate online discourse. Maybe not the best understanding, as I'm not even sure that is possible, but surely a better one. I don't have a dog in this race. I mean, I lived in a country with bigger fertility rate and one with small fertility rate, and my native country has today about the same total fertility rate as it had when I was born. There's definitely positives and negatives to each of these, and I'm fine with both. And personally, if we could have uh, kids uh, straight up to age 10 or 11, when you can start reasoning with them, I'd like 8 or 10 of my own. But since that's not possible, and I absolutely do despise children younger than 10, and especially younger than 5, good lord, then it's a huge nope for me. Still, I do maintain a social circle with people having 0, 1, 2, 3, and even a couple that has 4. So I do get some first-person feedback on all of the perspectives. In fact, I ran the core of most of this series through some of them as well for feedback which is something that I haven't seen pro-natalists or anti-natalists do, but then again, I'm neither. Call me natalist indifferent, if you want. Now, with that out of the way, this three-part series will cover technicalities, their application, where most people get it wrong, and only at the end, in the third episode, I'll go into potential policy to wrap up this series' main objective, which is to piss off everyone. 
The reason I expect to piss off almost everyone is because fertility and demographics is a topic that can only be discussed in relatively collectivistic terms, even though it is an inherently personal issue. So both pronatalists and antinatalists have to engage in some level of collectivism when discussing the issue. And this reality is unsettling for most liberals, including classical liberals, but not a problem for totalitarians. You see, there is a reason why policy-wise both extremes happened under communist regimes. The extreme of pronatalism happened in Romania between 1967 and 1989 under Nicolae Ceausescu. The extreme of antinatalism happened in People's Republic of China under Deng Xiaoping with the one-child policy. Although legally the Xiaoping era policies were abolished only in 2021, in reality the harsh part of it was between 1979 and 1989 at the most. Still, the Xiaoping era policies included forced abortion, forced sterilization, enormous fines and even sterilization of children. Sure, most antinatalists today will claim that they're horrified by this, but you see that's the thing with ideas they have consequences, and routinely they have consequences you've never thought about. Similarly with Ceausescu era policies, pro-natalists today claim they're horrified by the consequences of the 770 decree, but ideas have consequences. You may say you just want more births, but in reality you get more births, but also a skyrocketing rate of childbed mortality, up to 10 times higher than your poorer neighbors because ideas have consequences, and it's this mentality that we will apply throughout this series. All right, so I suppose that's enough with the long-winded introduction, let's get down to business. This will take a while, because technicalities that ensure precision unfortunately cannot be explained in a quick, quick three-minute TikTok video. So, chapter one. Definitions. Now, for those who've watched my 2021 video uh, in Romanian about the demographics of Romania, I do apologize in advance because this part will be quite boring for some of you. Feel free to skip it, but I have to make the definitions clear because, as I said, a lot of the online discourse flat out uses terminology wrongly, and that ambiguity then seeps into everything, into every single argument. Now, I'm sure some of that is lack of knowledge, but the bigger pusher of a narrative is the less believable uh, it is that that's ignorance. So, definitions. The birth rate is the ratio between the number of live births uh, in, the, in the year and the average total population of that year in that geographical area or jurisdiction. This is routinely confused with the notion of total fertility rate, which is the average number of children that are born to a woman over her reproductive lifetime. This average is calculated as total number of births in the interval divided by the total number of women that exist in that interval in that geographical area. The reproductive lifetime or reproductive interval is usually defined as the ages between 15 and 49, although in some countries it's 15 to 45 and sometimes 15 to 50. More on that in the next chapter. But as you can see, the birth rate and the total fertility rate are not the same thing at all. A country's birth rate can fall even if the total number of births remain the same. How? Well, Canada is a great example. Canada has been letting in a lot of male immigrants lately, especially younger ones. This means the total population rapidly increased, far outpacing new live births. So if in 2024 the exact same number of children is born as in 2023, the birth rate will look lower because it is pred predicated on the total population, which grew up faster through uh, immigration. This is why anyone worth his salt uh, discussing demographics will overwhelmingly focus on the total fertility rate, which, as explained a bit earlier, is dependent on what matters, which is the total number of fertile women in that region or country. The total fertility rate is a statistical indicator that shows you the trend. You can start accurately projecting some demographic realities 10 years from now by looking at the total fertility rate in the previous 3 or 4 or 5 years. Now, I'm not saying that the birth rate is a meaningless indicator, it's not. But I am saying that the two are not the same and they do have 
separate use cases. So for instance, if you're a mayor in a city of, let's say 50,000 people, you don't need any of these. You need the raw total of live births. But if you're a mayor in a metropolis of 2 million people, the birth rate is very useful when deciding whether you'll want more kindergartens in the city or you're good with just maintaining those you currently have, or maybe you can even demolish some of them as it's the case in Seoul, uh, South Korea. But more on that later. And speaking of births, the definition of live births is one of the many sources of inaccuracies when comparing countries or even regions within the same country. So for instance, here's the CDC definition in the United States, quote, live birth means the complete expulsion or extraction from its mother of a product of human conception, irrespective of the duration of pregnancy, which after such expulsion or extraction breathes or shows any other evidence of life, such as beating of the heart, pulsation of the umbilical cord, or definite, or definite movement of voluntary muscles, whether or not the umbilical cord has been cut or the placenta is attached. Heartbeats are to be distinguished from transient cardiac contractions. Respirations are to be distinguished from fleeting respiratory efforts or gasps." Unquote. Sounds about right. Well, yes, except only 48 states in the United States use that definition. Belgium, for instance, has two standards for live births, one for Flanders and the German-speaking area, and one for Wallonia. Things get even worse when it comes to reporting infant mortality. Again, per the CDC, quote, each fetal death of 350 grams or more, or if weight is unknown, of 20 completed weeks of gestation or more, calculated from the date last normal menstrual period began to the date of delivery, which occurs in this state, shall be reported within five days after delivery to the Office of Vital Statistics or as otherwise directed by state register, unquote. Sounds about right, isn't it? Well, yes, except this isn't even consistent within the US. Also per the CDC, quote, 11 areas report all periods of gestation as a fetal death. 25 areas report gestation period between 20 weeks or more. 13 areas specify birth weight of 350 grams or more, or 20 weeks of gestation or more. One area specifies 20 weeks or more, or birth weight of 400 grams or more. One area specifies 20 weeks or more, uh, or birth weight of 500 grams or more. One area specifies birth weight of 350 grams or more. Three areas specify birth weight of 500. Uh, one area specifies 16 weeks of gestation and more. And one area specifies five months of gestation or more, unquote. Translation. You cannot trust the stats on infant mortality in the United States, none of them. They're all either straight up wrong or flawed. Conversely, you can't trust the stats on life expectancy at birth either, because they're all influenced by this, I'm sorry to say, fuckery. The same is true for most of Europe, particularly Belgium. <laughs> Under Belgian legislation, the loss of a baby in utero after 22 weeks of gestation or 140 days of pregnancy or with a birth weight of more than 500 grams is considered a stillbirth. Translation, the exact same pregnancy outcome is a boost to infant mortality in 47 states of the United States and all of Eastern Europe, while in Belgium it's stillbirth and thus not counted in the infant mortality rate in the statistics. The reason I insist with these definitions is because we don't have, if we don't have precision in language, then we're all speaking past each other. And no, demographics is not a topic that can be covered in a TikTok video. Definitions matter. Precisions, precision matters. So next time you see someone, for instance, claiming that things are getting worse in the United States because look, the, there's an increase in infant mortality, don't forget to ask, compared to what? and by what definition and compared to whose definitions. Once you ask that, most of the ideologues will suddenly be very unwilling to have a chat, either because they really know they're full of it because they or, or because they themselves never bothered to read the methodology. Quite a lot of people who talk about this on the internet don't even know what methodology is. For more on that, please do check out my video from 2023 called Five Ways You Are Being Lied To With Statistics. Links will be, of course, 
in the low bar. Quite a lot of links for each of these, uh, these episodes. The first example in that video is a longer delve into how these statistics work. Going forward, another indicator that you will see thrown around in discussions about demographics and fertility is natural growth rate. This indicator is in fact quite not useful in a world of constant global migration. Still, the natural growth rate is the total number of births minus the total number of deaths and divided by population. Oh wait, no, that's the definition that is used in the United Kingdom. The European Commission uses just the numerator, the total number of births minus the total number of deaths, and just assesses if it's positive or negative. That's it. Oh, and the European Commission doesn't use the same name. Sometimes the natural growth rate is called the natural change rate or natural increase rate because reasons. Other places in the world use the birth rate minus the death rate as a formula to calculate this, thus opening the indicator to even more statistical artifacts. Translation, you cannot compare natural growth rate between countries. They quite literally measure different things in different places. More recently, the European Commission added net migration as an added component alongside natural growth. It's a really fun graph, and this graph probably got more votes for anti-establishmentarian political parties than any social media campaign, but I digress. Anyway, one more thing that uh, needs to be said here is not a definition, but rather a rule. The total fertility rate gives you an idea about a trend, but any and all predictions based on it are under the default assumption that current trends stay the same. Now, sometimes that assumption can be reasonable, but whenever you see someone making predictions, do check out to see if they bring up this caveat, and if they don't, they're probably selling you something. My favorite bullshit prediction is this one. South Korea will disappear at an, as a nation. Look at their total fertility rate, it's 0.7. And I'm like, yes, but that doesn't mean it will disappear. In fact, I'm pretty sure it won't. I mean, it's perfectly possible for South Korea to disappear, but their current total fertility rate is not an argument in favor of this position. Korea's total fertility rate is, at best, an argument that Korea's population will drop significantly provided that the current trends stay the same. And this caveat is always important. Still, with bombastic claims, it's always useful to check the raw numbers. Once you look at those, it turns out that there are more young fertile people in South Korea today than there are people in total in Uzbekistan, a country with a total fertility rate five times higher than Korea. So in reality, it's not that Korea is dying, it's more like if nothing changes, Korea of 2060 may or may not be the size of Uzbekistan today, and Uzbekistan of uh, 2060 will end up being more or less the size of Korea today. But who says nothing changes? Any prediction on longer than 20 years should be regarded as suspicious ipso facto. My favorite example, when it comes to hubris and making wrong predictions, is Bangladesh. Right after independence, the experts were claiming that Bangladesh will surpass the United States in population levels by 2020 at the very late, uh, at the very latest. Well, suffice to say that that didn't age well. In 2008, the experts were claiming that Bangladesh will reach 250 million people by 2050. Well, 16 years into the prediction, it's not looking anywhere near close to that. The thing with experts in demographics, just like with experts in anything, is that they rarely pay a price for being wrong. So the lesson here is this. Don't take any prediction seriously on demographics, especially if it's longer than 20 years. Why 20 years? Because that's the time a new generation can grow into becoming fertile itself. In an environment of fast population growth, like the 1970s in Bangladesh, the opinions of the new generation mattered quite a bit, a lot more than the experts thought it would. In an environment of fast population collapse, the opinions of the new generation may still end up mattering quite a bit, even in countries with extreme deference to seniority, like Japan, for instance. One more definition, demographic inertia or population momentum. 
These terms have been co-opted by other activist initiatives and thus drive more confusion. For instance, the term demographic inertia is now used by feminists in the academe to pretend uh, to calculate how much it will take to replace those evil men with obviously angelic women. The term population momentum is also wrongly defined on Wikipedia as being a consequence of demographic transition, but the problem is that it's not just that. Population momentum or demographic inertia is just a mathematical model which explains the potential for a population to grow or decline that is inherent within a population's age structure even when fertility is at a replacement level, mortality is consistent and net migration is zero. Now applying this to the real world gets murky because of course uh, net migration is never zero and mortality is never constant but broadly speaking allows one to make accurate predictions, imperfections notwithstanding. Like when I said that South Korea of 2060 may be as small as Uzbekistan today. That's a prediction made using population momentum model. But because it's a prediction for 40 years, there's plenty of things that could go wrong and eventually uh, lead to my pr prediction being, well, wrong. All right, maybe that's enough. I'll define new things if they come up. Let's get to chapter two, limitations. Now you see, the data is not ideal, which is the line researchers come up with every time you point out that the data may indeed be wrong or even intentionally manipulated. But even if we exclude bad intent on both the collection side of statistics and on presentation and uh, commenting there, uh, there are still a plethora of limitations which should make everyone more humble. So here's a few of them. One, bureaucratic inertia. Now on the internet these days, lurking or poking in various places, both antinatalist and pronatalist, I routinely saw perfectly valid papers or articles from 2018 or 2020 dismissed as ancient or not current enough. People who, should, could, who do that should be ignored on anything related to demographics. Because in demographics, bureaucratic inertia is a thing. It is basically impossible to have accurate, up-to-date data on these things, even in small countries, let alone in bigger ones, and especially bigger ones that have a federal model. If you look closely today, in September 2024, you'll be unable to find definitive demographic data for 2023 for most countries. Best case scenario, you find for 2022, and for some countries only for 2021. Why? Well, because collecting and compiling statistics is a tedious process. And since most of it is done by the state, the inherent laziness of bureaucrats always plays a role. And I don't mean just bureaucrats from the National Institutes for Statistics, I mean all bureaucrats. Like for instance, a live birth has a reporting time of up to one year in most places. So kids born in 2021, for instance, may get a birth certificate right there and then, but they may end up being counted in statistics in 2022 or even sometimes in 2023. Also, the way births and deaths are logged is routinely decentralized. So until all passes uh, through the layers of bureaucracy, mm, takes time. Add extra burdensome regulations like the GDPR in Europe, for instance, which means the data has to be anonymized before being sent to the National Institute for Statistics. And all of this inertia becomes an inherent limitation of the accuracy of the data. And it's not a small one either. In Spain, for instance, uh, <clears throat> most babies uh, are born in October. Given Spain's burdensome decentralized bureaucracy, it's between 10,000 and up to 50,000 births that may end up being recorded in the next year for statistical purposes. So again, 10 to 50,000 births may be counted in the next year. That's a lot. All of this is eventually corrected through a process called normalization. But that also takes months and up to two years, thus further making it difficult to compare countries because each country has its own procedures and its own timelines concerning recording, logging, normalization, and so on and so forth. Number two, as in the second limitation, you don't know what you don't know. 
More than 150 million children alive today in this world don't exist for statistical purposes. And that's a guesstimate, of course, because in fact we have no idea. So for instance, we look at this graph and see that Angola is on the same path as most of the world with a declining total fertility rate. But keep in mind that the total fertility rate is dependent on the total number of births. But the total number of births is determined by how many births were actually recorded. Well, as it turns out, there are nearly 4 million children in Angola who were born and lived to at least age 7 who were never recorded. So is the total fertility rate in Angola actually dropping? I don't know. Maybe. But it's likely been dropping much slower than this graph shows. I don't know. We don't know, actually. Because, you know, normalizing all of that is going to take forever. Mind you, this is not a problem specific to Angola or to poor countries. The Wuhan Health Organization claimed last year that 40% of new births are unregistered. If that is true, then is the global total fertility rate actually dropping? Or we've just become worse at record keeping? Or maybe both? We don't know. And there is a reason to believe the WHO on this. Reports from 2014 from various sources uh, claimed that about a third of new births are unregistered. And in 1998, UNICEF also was also claiming around a third of births being unregistered. Maybe they're all lying, or at least guessing wrongly about prevalence, but the phenomenon is very much real. The US even has a procedure for this. It's called delayed birth certification. It's impossible to find federal statistics on this because nobody bothers. I did some adding up of my own and found out that our American friends discover about 50,000 new children every year. That is to say, they discover them when they're of various ages between 1 and 18. Sometimes even later than that. Some adults find out that they weren't legally born. <laughs> This is an even bigger issue in Europe, with a combination of immigrant children on a continent with no internal borders and a land border with the Middle East, plus the various communities who simply don't care. Good luck finding those statistics. The governments in Europe simply don't bother to research this. And that's fine, I'm not saying they should. But I am saying that this is a limitation of the data, when, and when the phenomenon becomes big enough, it's a big limitation. I did this exercise with Romania a few years ago, read several private reports about kids without IDs, and then retroactively added their births to their respective years, and the results were quite surprising. But that was more of a nerd exercise. I used a lot of assumptions and projections that may or may not have been true. Also, clerical errors or practices inside a country can lead to misleading conclusions. For instance, in July, the press in Romania was listing localities on the verge of disappearance because zero or under five children were born in those localities last year. Now, villages disappearing is not a new phenomenon, it's been happening for centuries everywhere in Europe, but in this particular case, the conclusion was at least in part wrong because more children had actually been born in those localities, it's just that they were either not registered or registered in the nearby towns where a state office was available. There are also similar examples uh, from Australia, and really everywhere if you look close enough. And all of these do pile up to the point that they may indeed be statistically significant enough. Similarly, with legal marriage being increasingly irrelevant in more and more places around the world, all arguments about societal, cultural and demographic trends that use the marriage rate as a proxy are now increasingly ipso facto null and void. Why? Because you actually don't know how many people live in a de facto marriage, that's why. And this is true not just in Europe, but it's also true in South America and a lot of the Muslim world as well. For those who don't know, a marriage certificate and registration with the state is not necessary to be recognized as married in the Muslim world. The copium with projections about cohabitation rate that various globalist organizations publish is just that. Copium in an attempt to appear serious and on top of things. The easiest way to figure out just how wrong they are is to look for a more objective stat, namely number of children born from unmarried parents. Germany, for instance, has an 8% cohabitation rate, says the Social Trends Institute, uh, reporting in the Sustainable Demographic Dividend. I swear to God I'm gonna puke if I see the word sustainable one more time. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> the problem is 
that 33% of the kids born in Germany are from unmarried parents, but unlike the United States, the end result of that is not single mothers in the vast majority of the cases. The parents continue to live together, they just don't think it's important to get the state involved in their bedroom. Now, this latter statistic, the kids being born from unmarried parents, is a little bit harder to fake, because those kids are real, they exist, they breathe. So more likely than not, the cohabitation rate number is wrong. And speaking of Germany, the data can be outright wrong in the opposite direction as well. In 2024, Germany started counting people a bit more thoroughly and the old-fashioned way, and found fewer than the estimation. So what I'm saying is that humbleness should be more common when discussing demographics. You really don't know what you don't know. This will become relevant later on, particularly in episode 3, but also, I think, towards the end of this video. Number three, or the third limitation, migration. This is a big issue today in Europe and Africa, and was a big issue in Latin America 20 or 30 years ago. In November 2023, the European Court of Human Rights ruled in uh, the case called GTB versus Spain that there is a positive right to birth registration. The case itself was one of a guy born in 1985 in Mexico, out of a Spanish mother, who then repatriated to Spain just weeks after due to the earthquake in Mexico. She filed to have her kid registered as Spanish, but the bureaucracy disagreed. It took until 2006 that the Spanish bureaucracy finally fixed this, and only after being ordered to do so by an administrative court. This guy, now an adult, sued the Spanish state for the damages caused to him by not having an ID card, and 17 more years later, the European Court of Human Rights agreed with him. Clown case all around, but it's also the first time we see jurisprudence uh, around things like these. In practice, however, things like these are a lot more common, and the cases are n either never solved, or solved quietly after several years, but without much of a big fuss. For instance, a kid is uh, born in Sweden from a, let's say, Italian mother and a Swedish father. Five days after, this, uh, uh, after that, the couple flies with the kid to Rome and registers the kid there. Now, where is that birth being counted for statistical purposes? That's a tr trick question, because there is no answer. There is no way to know. Statistics Minding Hetten doesn't say what their methodology is when compiling statistics. So it may very well be the case that the kid is recorded twice, once in Sweden, once in Italy. This issue is not theoretical. For instance, when it comes to migration to Sweden, <clears throat> all discussions focuses on migration coming into the country, but they, it discounts the people, the Swedish citizens, who move out of Sweden and end up having children abroad. This issue has been popping up so many times that recently the parliament had to amend the old citizenship law, which said children born abroad out of Swedish parents would lose their citizenship by age 22 if they don't take a trip to Sweden to sign some paperwork. And this issue now pops up everywhere in Europe, and will continue to pop up even more in the next decades. Thousands, if not tens of thousands, of Ukrainian children were born in various European Union countries in the last two years. Where are those counted for statistical purposes? Well, it depends. The Ukrainian procedure says the parents should take a trip to a Ukrainian embassy or consulate. Yeah, good luck with that. I bet at least half didn't even know this or care. The limitation here is a systemic one. The method to collect statistics about population is a 19th century method, or an even a, an 18th century method in some countries of Europe, and just straight up unfit for 21st century needs. Number four, politics. Okay, so this is a self-evident one, right? It's a lot more common than people imagine that countries st straight up lie about their demographics for political reasons. I showed in the Central Asia series how Turkmenistan exaggerated the size of its Uzbek minority in order to secure investments from Uzbekistan, knowing that the new Uzbek president was sensitive to minority communities abroad. 
but this isn't specific to Turkmenistan. Russia is heading to 19th century population levels according to Rostat. Nobody believes that, including the Kremlin, which now pretty much assumes that things are far, far worse than that. But of course, they won't say that in public. Sanitizing your demographic data for political reasons is a lot more common than people think. A lot of states in the United States do it too, for redistricting and reapportionment processes. All of this also poisons the data on fertility, and it is an inherent limitation. Political actors will always meddle in this, and there is not much that can be done about it, other than keeping in mind that this exists and thus add more humbleness into one's analysis. Well, there are other limitations as well, but I'll stop here because I'd rather keep this video under two hours. Let's see if we succeed. <laughs> so yeah, uh, chapter three, history and mythology. And this is where we could go on for five hours and still barely scratch the surface. The amount of bad takes about fertility is so high that it's getting depressing. Whether you're pro-natalist or anti-natalist, you have to concede that most people who agree with you are either crazy, on the spectrum, or acting in bad faith. I wish this weren't the case, but this is a very serious topic, and, well, it is the case. Sorry. <clears throat> so, let's go through, let's say, the loudest ones. Number one, natal socialism, and this one is the loudest because online discourse is US-centric. The United States has a federal policy that can accurately be described as natalist indifferent. As a policy, the federal government doesn't discourage child rearing, at least not directly, though there's more nuance to that and we'll get to it in episode 3. Also, as a policy, the US federal government doesn't discourage child re uh, rearing either, so you know, it's very indifferent most of the time. So more likely than not, American pronatalists will be very loud in proposing policies that effectively amount to pronatal socialism. That is to say, policies that are meant to redistribute money from child childless and older wealthy people to those who have more children. Sounds good in theory, but like all forms of socialism, it doesn't work, and to make things worse, it ends up incentivizing the worst form of behavior. The reason this kind of agitprop has any traction at all is because of ignorance. As a rule, our American friends are incredibly and extremely ignorant about the rest of the world. As I was saying, the average American holds ideas that would be extremist even to European liberals, and way too many Americans genuinely think that the world is one giant USA, but should, you should trust me on this, it's really not. And due to that ignorance, <laughs> most of those who propose na natal socialism <clears throat> are simply unaware that most of their policy proposals have in fact already been tried for decades in multiple parts of the world, with no statistically significant result to speak of. Daily News Hungary, April 2024. Hungarian natural demographic decline, the highest in Europe. Uh-oh, how did this happen? Hungary is a routinely cited example among pronatalists of just how good Orban's policies are for fertility. The Hungarian Institute for Statistics says that in Hungary, no country reached the critical 2.1 level, level closest, uh, uh, no, no county, sorry, uh, reached 2.1 closest being uh, Sabolcs, Satmar, Bereg, and Borsod counties with 1.85 and 1.88 indexes, respectively. Comparatively, in Budapest, this number was only 1.16. Oh, maybe I should have mentioned this at mythology. <clears throat> the 2.1 level is in itself mythological in practice. You can have stability at 1.8, or you can have population decrease at 2.5, or even higher. Why? Because demographics is about people, and people are not fixed mathematical variables. In a world of fast migration and longer life expectancy, there are other phenomena that can influence the population trends of a place. For instance, the Republic of Georgia has had a total fertility rate of around 2.1 for the last decade, yet its population slightly decreased. But anyway, statistics aside, it seems that while everyone is aware that correlation doesn't involve causation, the converse is not true. Causation has to involve at least some level of correlation. So if Hungary's fertility policies are so damn good, then why don't they correlate to higher fertility? 
And when I ask this, the pro data lists usually have two answers. One is to bicker about marginal data and uh, look at, you know, maybe it's a misplaced comma or something. And the other is to say that, well, yeah, that doesn't quite work that great, but at least something was done. So for instance, they'll show you this graph that shows a bit of growth from 2010. Okay, but most of the pro-natalist policies are from 1999 and a few more are legacies from communist era. Besides, while the graph looks like the line goes up in absolute numbers, nothing really changed. In other words, this is a statistical artifact. The absolute number of births is in fact lower than in 2010. And here, the pro-natalists either fold and say, well, that's all that could have been done, and it's a good thing that something was done, or they go on on weird tangents. And fine, that's all that could have been done is not a terrible answer, but at what cost? Hungary spends a disproportionate amount of its national income on fertility, yet its results are worse than its two neighbors, Romania or Czechia. In other words, if you make the argument that just because it costs money doesn't mean you shouldn't do it, well, yeah, but the results are still bad. As you can see, the growth in total fertility rate is nearly identical in Czechia and Romania, all while these two neighbors of Hungary made effectively no change in their policies. In fact, Romania lowered its overall spending on fertility, though only slightly. When offered such examples, we're routinely greeted with Yes, but that's over there. Over here, it will work out, which is either a manifestation of xenophobia or a version of real communism hasn't been tried, quite frankly. Because it's not just Hungary. Uh, Legis Julie in the omnibus bill originated with uh, Emperor Augustus in 18 BC, which aimed to criminalize infidelity, pay people to have children, including the plebs, increase the status of motherhood by introducing a legal standard for ideal woman. Yes, I'm not joking. All of that happened more than 2000 years ago. Did it work? No, of course not. A bit over 100 years later, uh, Tacitus was writing about basically the same problems as those mentioned by Emperor Augustus as reasons to pass the omnibus bill. By 100 Anno Domini, Soranus of Ephesus had come up with basically the same idea that is now running through pro-natalist circles, namely to increase fertility via eugenics and science. Did that, did that work? No, of course not. The point I'm trying to make is that no population is really that exceptional. And none of this is, in fact, new. So, here's an even more recent example. In 1920, France had a total fertility rate that is lower than that of today. And so did uh, through the, the 1980s. And in the 1850s, France had the lowest total fertility rate in Europe by far. Which, by the way, for the materialists out there, was a decisive factor in allowing France to continue to at least keep up, if not continue to be competitive, with industrialized England. Now, did France introduce uh, natal socialism in 1920 to cause that spike that you can see there that it followed? No, of course not. Anyway, number two. Insert your favorite vice here. <laughs> In preparation for this series, I made the funny video about the true story from uh, Estonia. The reason I made that one is because <clears throat> there is a huge contingent out there of pro-natalists who genuinely think their pet peeves are the be-all and end-all of fertility. The problem is that that's just not true. I'll use the example of France once again. France is the first country on earth where pornographic films were produced, also the first where such a scene was published in public, right? The United States being the second. This was happening in the closing years of the 19th century, yet the graph on total fertility rate shows zero correlation. Same goes for other pet peeves. More education, especially for women, correlates with lower fertility, screamed the pro-natalists. Okay, then explain Kazakhstan. I'll leave in the description a very thorough study on the sustained and universal fertility recuperation in Kazakhstan. It's a very interesting read. But here I will say this. 
Kazakhstan doubled its total fertility rate from 1.8 to 3.6 or more in under 20 years, all while most everyone got richer, most people than, more people than ever, not just women, got more education, the country got more urbanized, and all the while the level of religiosity stayed the same or slightly declined. Again, if causation is real, then we should see some correlation. And Kazakhstan is not some island nation subjected to statistical artifacts. If Hungary is a good example for pro-natalists, then Kazakhstan, which is bigger, is also a good example. Or feminism. Now, I'm not denying that dog shit ideas, such as feminism, have a societal effect, but I do question if its effects on overall fertility are really that pronounced. I mean, Qatar exists. The total fertility rate in Qatar is at the same level as Denmark and slightly lower than France. And there are many things to be said about Qatar, but feminist is not one of them. Because remember, most people are not academic feminists. Most people don't even go to college to begin with, and most people don't have a career. So, judging the total fertility rate of a Western country by the excesses of its loudest anti-natalist extremists is quite questionable especially in a context where counterexamples are trivial to find. When faced with these examples, some pro-natalists retort that the effect is still real even though it's not uniform. Okay, but how do you quantify that? If the drop is very similar in places with diametrical opinions about feminism or porn or other vices, then it stands to reason that those things are really not that important to the discussion uh, concerning fertility. And again, I'm not claiming there is no effect. There certainly is a negative effect in the quality of life of families and children that is owed to a lot of terrible ideas. And it's easy to notice that in the rise of uh, absent parents, the socioeconomic outcomes of children are worse and so on and so forth. But the effect on fertility itself is not clear at all. And claiming otherwise, at least at this point, with the evidence available, is misinformation. Number three, crime stats improve. This is a myth spread primarily by antinatalists. In reality, if you press them hard, they have basically two examples, both of them derived from the so-called uh, donohue livet hypothesis, which is based on a study in Sweden from 1966, yes, really, almost 60 years ago, and then superimposing the conclusions of that study onto the crime stats of the United States and Romania from 1990 till 2001 and 2011, respectively. The hypothesis goes uh, that there is a 16 to 20 years gap between the legalization of abortion, which is an antinatalist policy, and a drop in crime. The examples are the continuous drop in crime in the United States from 1991 onwards, that is to say 18 years after Roe v. Wade, and the same drop in crime in Romania from 2008 onwards, that is to say 18 years from the abolition of the 770 decree. Now, the problem with this argument is that it appears to make sense to people who know nothing about history. After all, unwanted children may indeed be more likely to be criminals, right? And not having them in the first place, not having them born in the first place, could reduce precisely the kind of people more likely to become criminals, right? Well, no, not really. <laughs> you see, <clears throat> crime has been going up in Sweden for the last 20 years now, even though there has been no change in the abortion policy since 1975, and abortion has been de facto legal in Sweden since 1946. Also, the first study to show this correlation made in Sweden was in 1966, and the crime rate going down in Sweden since 1946 could very well have been due to the fact that the war was over. Yes, yes, I know, Sweden didn't participate in World War II, but everyone around her did. And you always do get a spike in the crime wave in the aftermath of a war, which then eventually fizzles out. Again. If there is a causation relationship between abortion policy and lower crime rates, then we should also see a consistent correlation relationship, but that is not happening. Similarly, in the United States, there are multiple uh, equally legitimate reasons for why crime went down, ranging from uh, the phasing out of leaded gasoline or improving the overall economic situation, which, by the way, routinely does lead to criminals changing their behavior. You see. 
When there's good money to be made from selling drugs, for instance, it becomes good for business to keep the neighborhoods more quiet. The overall violent crime rate does go down when business gets good, and this is true for both licit and illicit business. <clears throat> and then there are particularities. In the US, changes in crack cocaine use likely contributed the most to reducing violent crime than pretty much any policy anywhere in the country. In Romania, on the other hand, the improvement of economic conditions and the possibility to easily export criminals somewhere else also improved the crime rate. These kinds of particularities are not trivial at all, as they address a fundamental incentive to crime, in a way that, well, abortion policy simply doesn't. Oh, and by the way, the American hypothesis on this doesn't even hold water by its own sources. Not only is the CDC data that they use, well, kind of incomplete, shocking, I know, but also that data itself shows that the crime rate drops first among older criminals. But if this hypothesis were true, namely that legalizing abortion prevents the birth of new criminals, then the violent crime rate should have dropped faster among the youth, or at the very least, first among the youth. Of course, this didn't happen because it is always the youth that commit more crime. And this reality is always skewed by pro-natalists who get really upset when you bring up that a high total fertility rate necessarily comes with more crimes. But more on that later in the series. Uh, number four, religion. Now, this is only partially mythology. Yes, religiosity does correlate with higher fertility, but that correlation is much weaker than internet personalities would have us believe, and the reverse is not necessarily true. For instance, the total fertility rate in Ethiopia has been dropping uninterruptedly for 40 years already. It's still high, but nowhere near as high as it used to be, all while the level of religiosity in fact increased significantly. An even better example is the Islamic Republic of Iran. See that drop over there in 1980? Yeah, that's the installment of the Islamist regime. Turns out that theocracy is, not just a, is just not a good idea for fertility. Today, Iran has a total fertility rate smaller than Romania or France, and it continues to drop at a very fast rate. The proponents of this argument that if we just make more, increase the level of religiosity will solve fertility, the proponents, they usually quote Israel, and particularly this graph, which shows that the most religious Jews pretty much outpace everyone else, but especially the secular Jews, which show a pattern no different than Europeans. Okay, fair enough, but everything makes sense in context. The context being that Orthodox Jews are not subjected to the military draft and are in fact subsidized by the government. The same people who insist that everything is economics are now suddenly silent when it comes to Israel, where in fact economics does play a big role in why the Haredim have a higher fertility. But putting Israel aside, let's look at other highly religious countries, shall we? Uh, here's Georgia arguably the most religious country in Europe, uh, which also captivated the imagination of pro-natalists uh, when the patriarch said he will personally baptize every family's third child or more, an action which was quoted as a cause for Georgia's increase in fertility. Okay, fair enough, but can we agree that that growth is still kind of marginal and quite inconsistent? Here's an even more interesting graph. Tunisia, Turkey, and Morocco. The level of religiosity in Turkey has been growing in the last decade, stayed stable in Tunisia, and marginally decreased in Morocco. Yet the graph is the same. You can't say religiosity is everything in Israel, but then dismiss the much bigger examples that straight up contradict the hypothesis. And again, there's Qatar and United Arab Emirates. The UAE fell below so-called replacement levels almost 20 years ago when the setup was far more religious than today. And Qatar is an absolutist religious monarchy, the kind of which the most extreme pro-natalist LARPers on the internet claim they want to see in the West. Okay, but how is that working out? See, the point that I'm trying to make here is that while religiosity may help 
terms and conditions may apply, everything makes sense in context, it's nowhere near as important as it's made out to be. It may indeed be the case that moderate religion helps, but theocracy just doesn't. Um, also, there is at least one highly inconvenient example, Czechia. Arguably the most atheistic country in the world. 40% of the country declares itself atheist outright, another 14% insist they have no religion. This is how their total fertility rate looks like. Now, I'm not going to claim that the rise of atheism in the Czech Republic increased its fertility, but I will claim that the effect of religion is not visible at all on the Czech graph. And everyone who is honest with themselves will necessarily agree. All right, number five. This is the worst it's ever been. This is basically standard doomerism you will see on the internet because it draws clicks. In fact, the main reason this video will not be seen by many people is precisely because it's neither doomerist nor excessively optimist. Still, it needs to be said. No, this is not the worst it's ever been. The data shows it's rather a reversion to the mean in most countries. Here's the part where it matters to be cognizant of what the data means. Yes, total fertility rate, which is again a statistical indicator, looks bad, although I already gave examples where it looked worse in the past in multiple places, but globally there were more children born in 2023 than in the year 1950, which is associated with a baby boom. And this stands true for every single region in the world, including Europe, Latin America, and North America. Okay? Saying that this year, or any year in the last decade, is the worst based on the total fertility rate only makes sense if you think the human population should always grow. But why should that be the case? It sure wasn't the case historically, so why now? In fact, historically, population stability was the standard. And this is the biggest fact that doomers refuse to confront. It's only been a few hours, civilizationally speaking, since we've been so many on the planet. This fact is taken by antinatalists to claim that it's a good thing to have fewer children, while pronatalists ignore this fact and assume that the fertility rates of the 1950s are, or at the very least, ought to be the norm. They're both wrong, and are both ignoring possible, uh, different, uh, possibly different uh, explanations. Because again, if a phenomenon occurs more or less simultaneously across geographies and cultures, then it's very likely that something natural or biological is afoot. It's more likely than not that the current moment is just a reversion to the mean. Countries that were never big into huge families see a much lower degree of depressing fertility, while the countries that saw a rapid natural increase of population in the last century now see an equally rapid decrease. So for all intents and purposes, we are seeing a reversion to the mean in most places. Why that happens is an interesting question, and hopefully I'll address some of it in the next episode, but the fact that this is happening is increasingly very hard to deny. And the fact that this is happening is not inherently cause for alarm, unless you're invested into various Ponzi schemes like the state pensions, in which case you should come clean over your motivations instead of hiding that and pretend that uh, it's all about uh, our civilization or whatever, because it's not and we all know it, okay? Number six, the last mythology. But our civilization. This is an exclusively Western argument. This argument only works if you ignore the rest of the world. China lost almost 7 million people to natural decrease just last year. China has a very similar problem. As for Russia, well, I already mentioned that, it's even worse. India also has a below fertility rate and is just slightly behind the West's curve, and so is North Africa. As for Central Africa, yes, they are 50 years behind the West's curve, but rapidly catching up as well. So if you want to make an argument uh, that uh, is about Western civilization, then by all means do make that argument, but please don't fearmonger. There's plenty of room between the anti-natalist view and doomerism, and I'll try to make some of that argument in episode 3, but until then uh, I think I'll stop here as this video has already been, yeah, 
too long. In the next episode, which will appear tomorrow, we'll look into the common faults of antinatalists and pronatalists and the commonly observed factors that either decrease, uh, depress, increase, or at least facilitate fertility. That won't be easy either, but at least uh, there will be fewer technicalities to bore you with. So with all of that being said, thank you all for watching. Don't forget to subscribe, send me to the cartels, and I will see you all soon. Uh, well, actually tomorrow on the Freedom Alternative. Cheers.